This video is brought to you by Brilliant. In the past few years, Sweden has been rocked by a grim wave of gang violence. Its firearm homicide rate is now the highest in Europe, and grenade attacks in Swedish suburbs have hit the international headlines. Unsurprisingly, this has become a big talking point in Swedish politics, with the left blaming it on the retreat of Sweden's welfare state and the right blaming it on immigration. So in this video, we're going to have a look at Sweden's crime crisis, its possible causes, and how it might be solved. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start by just looking at the stats. Essentially, while Sweden has relatively low rates of petty crime, in the past few years or so, the country has seen a significant spike in both sexual crimes and violent crimes, especially firearm homicides. Since 2013, Sweden's firearm homicide rate has essentially tripled, and in 2022, over 60 people were killed by guns. This means that Sweden saw more firearm homicides than the rest of Scandinavia combined, with the highest per capita rate in Europe. Similarly, while it's come down a bit in the past few years, the fraction of Swedes self-reporting exposure to a sexual offence is more than twice as high as it was in the 2000s. The increase has been particularly acute with women, with the number of women self-reporting exposure to a sexual offence quadrupling since 2000. Things don't look like they've really improved this year either. In the first 10 months of 2023, there were 48 fatal shootings and 139 explosions from weapons like dynamite and hand grenades, more than in any previous year. This continuing spike in violent crime seems to be mostly driven by feuds involving a drug gang called Foxtrot, which came to prominence after European police cracked an encrypted network called EncroChat in 2020. This allowed Swedish police to essentially bring down a whole load of established drug gangs in Sweden, but this just created an opening in the market that was promptly filled by Foxtrot, who've turned out to be probably more violent than their predecessors. Now, it's easy to overstate the severity and uniqueness of this crisis. Sweden has always had a bit of a problem with gangs, and the country has a low crime and murder rate by international standards. Nonetheless, this spike has made crime the number one issue in Swedish politics. Polling suggests that Swedes feel less safe than ever before, and are therefore more concerned about crime in society than ever before. Crime was the biggest issue for voters at the 2022 election, with a 41% plurality of Swedes saying it was their number one issue. And in October of this year, Prime Minister Ulf Kristersson gave a rare speech to the nation outlining how his government planned to reduce the violence through increased police resources, longer sentences for convicted criminals, and new surveillance powers. Unsurprisingly, all this has sparked a debate between the Swedish left and right about both the causes and solutions to Sweden's crime crisis. In general, the left blames the gutting and privatisation of the Swedish welfare state, which used to be one of the most generous in the world. For most of the 20th century, Sweden was a model of social democracy. The left-wing Social Democrats were in power continuously from 1932 until 1976, except for a brief period in 1936 when Axel Persson Bramstorp from the Farmers League was Prime Minister. During that time, they created the Folkhemet, or People's Home, a cradle-to-grave welfare state that was one of the most progressive in the world. Like many centre-left parties, the Social Democrats' electoral dominance really started waning in the 90s, as neoliberal ideas became increasingly mainstream and Social Democrats struggled with the economic turbulence of the 80s. Much of the Swedish welfare state was duly cut or privatised, and government spending fell from 70% of GDP down to less than 50%. The left argues that this has increased both wealth inequality and regional inequality, which has in turn increased crime. Sweden's Gini coefficient, which essentially measures income inequality, has gone from about 0.23 in the 1980s, one of the lowest if not the lowest in the world, to 0.34 today, higher than the European average. Similarly, Sweden's regional inequality has gotten significantly worse. Swedish authorities have designated 22 extremely vulnerable areas prone to crime and violence, which often have high unemployment, low wages, and poor public services. The right, on the other hand, focus on immigration. 
For the last few decades, Sweden has pursued a remarkably open immigration policy and developed a reputation as a humanitarian superpower. Net migration into the country really started accelerating in the 2000s and hit a peak during the mid-2010s. Today, roughly 20% of Sweden's population, or around 2 million people, were born abroad, nearly double the EU average of 12%. A further 5% have two foreign-born parents, and about 3%, roughly quarter of a million people, are refugees. As of 2020, Sweden has the ninth most refugees per capita globally, and the second highest in Europe after Malta. The right point out that the majority of violent crimes are committed by immigrants. Of those prosecuted for gun crimes since 2017, 85% were born abroad or had at least one parent who was. And a similar fraction of gang members apparently have an immigrant background. This has affected how Swedes view immigration. Eurobarometer polling suggests that, in the past few years, Swedes have become increasingly wary of immigration, with the fraction of Swedes seeing immigration as mainly an opportunity falling from 45% to 31% between 2017 and 2021. At the same time, the fraction of Swedes seeing immigration as a problem has risen from 19% to 31%. Similarly, European Social Survey polling found that Swedish perceptions of immigrants hit an all-time low in 2022, with 29% of Swedes saying that they had a negative view of immigrants. As well as immigration, the right also blames Sweden's lax criminal sentencing laws, which are essentially easy on teenagers. Teenagers can only be sentenced to a maximum of four years for firearm homicide, which has made them ideal candidates for gangs, who've started using kids to carry out their crimes. The Sweden Democrats have instead suggested that anyone over 13 should face adult penalties for severe crimes, including life in prison, and that gang members with non-Swedish backgrounds be deported. The current government has already said that they want Danish penalties for Swedish crimes, a nod to Denmark's tougher rules, and announced plans to both increase police numbers and give the police more surveillance powers. The Swedish police are clearly struggling. Today, only 20% of murders get solved, compared to about 80% in the past. The one thing the right and the left both agree on, though, is that Sweden hasn't done enough to integrate its migrant population. Many of those extremely vulnerable areas that the left see as a symptom of an insufficient welfare state also have large migrant populations, who end up getting stuck in a chronically poor area without integration into the rest of Swedish society. In the near term, whether Sweden can solve its crime crisis will probably depend in part on whether it can get integration right. A lot of the stuff that we talk about at TLDR can seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive into economics and detailed data. But there's a fun and easy way to learn more, which also doesn't cost thousands of dollars or take years and years of schooling. That's because Brilliant is the best way to learn maths, data science, and computer science interactively. It doesn't even take long to learn, either. These complex topics are broken down into accessible chunks, designed around your busy schedule. That means that by spending just a few minutes a day, you can accumulate new knowledge over time in an actually fun way. As time goes on, you'll get used to that empowering feeling of learning too, because this isn't just about memorization and lectures. Brilliant teaches you by doing, using active learning techniques to teach you the principles behind otherwise complex subjects, and ensuring you actually understand what's going on. So whether you want to brush up on your basic math skills, improve your employment prospects by learning about future technologies, or just have fun with coding, you can check out everything that Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days. Click on the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support.